Okay, we are live on YouTube. Devajyoti, can you please introduce uh, the speakers? Yeah, sure. Uh, welcome to day four of NeurIPS 2020 meetup. Uh, so today, Ranjan Devnath will be speaking on distillation networks. And at 8.30, Sarvagya Singh will be speaking on machine learning of application of AI in real world. Thank you. So I'd just like to request Ranjan Devnath to uh, start if he is ready. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, I am audible. Uh, okay. Uh, very good evening. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me here as a speaker. So uh, uh, can we start now then? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, and uh, don't call me sir. I'm just uh, your same in NCC pass out only just two years back. Nanjanda is actually an alumnus. Uh, so it really took a lot less effort with him. Uh, Although I had to actually call him a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, just uh, let me know once my screen is visible. Yes, the screen is visible. Uh, no, sir, please. Uh, you can tell uh, same as Ranjan, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, is the presentation visible? Yes, it's visible. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, our topic here today is uh, knowledge distillation in neural networks. So, we, like all of us, have pretty much of idea like what is neural networks, why you we use them in the field of uh, deep learning and what can we do with neural networks right so taking this as like very baseline as the attendees so going forward like uh, in neural network we know like uh, there has been like a lot of different architectures from very teeny smaller ones to very larger architectures which also includes like ensemble of different type of neural networks architectures and if we say about the latest the most complex and the biggest architecture that can be said as gpt3 so those kind of architecture of neural networks can take quite a lot of time to train and as well uh, when we are uh, using uh, those kind of uh, neural network architectures in suppose a production environment so that time um, like inferencing that is just like in real time the uh, uh, getting the output from the model with the input data so that part takes quite a lot of time and that can be a disadvantage in the case when we you try to incorporate that kind of architecture in a production system which needs like kind of real time output or not real time but as uh, nearly real time output is required so in those kind of scenario we try to uh, have the same uh, goal and get the same output in a lesser time inference. So in those kind of situations, the knowledge distillation kind of technique comes in. So here the basic understanding is, so as the subtopic has been written, like little students understands best about neuroscience from good teachers. So if we say that, uh, uh, if we are trying to uh, make a like five, six years student to try to understand that what is neuroscience and all, and you just uh, give that student that um, piece of theory and all those things, and he will be mad like this kid. And now suppose the, uh, like just for meme purpose and don't get it, don't get offended any DC fan. So now suppose Iron Man comes and he just tries to explain the same kid the thing, how he understands. And obviously like if uh, someone who understands the topic based, like for example, a teacher, so he will be like uh, able to make the student understand the same topic in a much complex way. Like suppose a like storytelling. And in that scenario, the student will be ultimately 
reacting like this okay so finally i got to understand this thing so this is just the basic introduction for the teacher student knowledge transfer and the teacher tries to uh, make the student understand a very complex uh, thing in a very simpler manner that the teacher already has idea of and the proper uh, technical knowledge about so uh, going forward so what is the knowledge here so suppose uh, we are referring to this picture so this is just a um, picture of digit 1 from the um, famous mnist data set so uh, here if we see this digit 1 uh, is kind of like looking similar of like 7 right so now uh, if we uh, give a like student model so if we uh, here the student model can be referred to as a very teeny or smaller architecture of neural network if we give um, if we train a student model in mnist data set and then its prediction seeing this image will be kind of similar like this that it is having a 0.9 uh, probability to be 1 and a 0.1 probability to be 7 right and uh, now suppose uh, we give the same thing um, we give the same thing to the teacher so teacher will understand uh, better uh, this uh, kind of knowledge here that how much this um, this thing is having the dependency and how much structural dependency it is hap- having towards the seven so this point more than point 0.9 this point 0.99 and point 0.01 kind of understanding better uh, describes this image so in this kind of scenario we are having uh, two different architectures teacher and student so here the teacher architecture stands for a very large or complex architecture here if you see uh, the first archi- the after the input layer of the neural network that is a mobile net v2 architecture has been taken that is having around uh, like 22 lakh 57984 trainable parameters and then on top of that we are just doing one round of average pooling and then at the end the dense layer connected so ultimately the teacher model architecture here is having the trainable uh, parameters of uh, 2 lakh 23 uh, uh, sorry uh, 22 lakh 30277 now if we uh, consider the student architecture right so here the student architecture is a very smaller one very teeny architecture it's just having a simpler introductory conv layer followed by max pool and then one another set of conv layer global global average pooling and two set of dense layers with ultimately reaching the trainable parameter results of uh, 1 lakh uh, 44261 so you can see right uh, how little uh, the trainable parameters heard here for the uh, student architecture compared uh, to the teacher architecture so uh, it will be uh, around just like 15% of the whole architecture of the teacher so now in this kind of scenario when the student uh, with much less experience uh, tries to understand this kind of images obviously it will uh, see uh, the true levels the true levels here i mean is for example um, uh, suppose uh, this uh, image of one right so this image of one if we go for a soft max uh, so at the end um, uh, with one level one hot level encoding it will be like uh, zero then in only on the first position um, it will be uh, one and all the rest will be zero now instead of that instead of those true levels if we try to uh, make the student understand this same thing from the teachers point of view that the teachers model has already understood from seeing this data so in this case the teacher model can see that uh, this one kind of looks little similar to 7 so it might uh, it will have the softmax uh, it it will have the output of this one as the prediction probability of uh, suppose say like, like around 0.99 and for the 7 it will have like 0.01 so it is having like little more little more um, 
giving priority to the seven as well that the original uh, lab, true labels will not so that is the main idea here we are focusing more on the softmax part of the teachers prediction from seeing this input image so uh, before going uh, any more forward i would uh, like to ask if any uh, questions or doubts are here no you are perfectly fine go on okay sure so now if we uh, go forward so this is a basic uh, loss function in in this kind of knowledge distillation model architectures so uh, here what we are having so we are uh, passing the student logics so student logics is the um, uh, softmax logics that the student model is predicting after seeing this image right and then this is teacher logics so teacher logics is already uh, the teacher model is already trained there on this mnist dataset and that um, predicted that trained model when seeing this same image will again give some prediction right the softmax output so this is that softmax output and then again we are having the true levels as well so true levels for this one will be like 0 1 and then the rest series as 0 and then one more parameter comes as temperature so temperature uh, here uh, is uh, for example taken as 5 so this is just a uh, configurable parameter to make the image more generalized like if we just uh, tell that uh, this Uh, one is around like 0.99. This image uh, looks around 0.99, similar to the uh, digit one. Then better than that, the student will be able to analyze and generalize the all set of images with a understanding that this image is kind of looking around 0.62 uh, towards the digit one and 0.28 towards the digit seven. So that's why we are dividing the teacher logics. as well the two student logics with this temperature to give a more generalized feelings to the output right so here if you see the teacher logics is divided by this temperature to get the teacher probabilities and uh, uh, similarly the student logics are also divided and then we are uh, calculating the categorical cross entropy loss so categorical cross entropy loss uh, saying that we are having like um, um, more number of classes not the not only binary classes so that's why we are using this loss function and once we calculate this then uh, we are again having the loss function uh, uh, for us to calculate the loss from the student logics as well as true labels so here if you see the true labels i already said that it will be 0 1 and the rest as similarly 0 and the student logics the students uh, probability uh, that it uh, predicts so these two losses we are getting the kd loss that is the knowledge distribution loss and this ce loss that is uh, with this true levels and then we are just uh, multiplying the kd loss and the student uh, the ce loss with some configurable parameters of alpha and beta and it is suggested that uh, with uh, around good values of configured this alpha beta we get the best results out of this so ultimately we are getting this total loss uh, similarly divided by alpha plus beta which is giving us the ultimate loss value and that loss value will be again um, used to update the parameters and continue the training so here the main thing what is happening is the teacher is already trained with the mnist dataset and now with the trained teacher model the student now sees the uh, same mnist dataset and with each training epoch it tries to um, predict uh, its um, outputs for that image and from that prediction it tries to back propagate with the loss of both the teachers teachers predicted um teachers predicted outputs as well as the true labels and finally we get a mixture of uh, loss that we uh, uh, update the parameters with so now uh, not uh, let's uh, get our hands little dirty by seeing the code base here and just for the sake of any dc fans here is the joker as well <laughs>
Okay. Mm. So uh, here in the first lines, we are just uh, importing the necessary libraries and all. So for TensorFlow here, we are importing this uh, mobile net V2. And we are also using the TensorFlow data set. So for this uh, practical example, we are uh, using the flower data set from TensorFlow data sets. And as you can see, uh, after loading this, we are just using some couple of uh, pre-processed uh, steps like converting this to float 32 for the computation um, efficiency is using NumPy and all. And then uh, ultimately resizing it to the specified format so that it can be consumed uh, both as well the teacher and the student. And uh, the data loading pipeline, like pre-processing steps, then cache, then uh, shuffle these data sets, and as well the specifying the batch size to pass this in the training flow. So first, we are going with the teacher architecture. So you can see the base model, that is the teacher model, is taken from this mobile net v2 with the weights from ImageNet dataset. And we are specifying this uh, input shapes as well. And so uh, we are uh, now in this step adding this base model with one set of global average pooling 2D and the end dense layer, as you saw in the PPT. So this uh, function gives us ultimately the teacher model with a summary of this that uh, total trainable parameters of 22,30,277. And in this step, we are just uh, specifying our loss function and optimizer. We are uh, using the sparse categorical uh, cross entropy loss here and the atom with a um, learning rate of 1 5. So here we are uh, getting the teacher model here and compiling and training with this uh, data set with just five uh, rounds of epoch. So once this uh, training is completed, we get a validation accuracy of 0 0.9073 and training accuracy of 0 0.9446 which is quite comparable with this little number of epochs of training and uh, so uh, any questions so far with this teacher model preparation Uh, hello, am I audible? Uh, hello, Shomdev, am I audible? Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, was there any um, network issue in the in between? I was just trying to check if. Uh, no, uh, your screen share just uh, got stopped. Uh, okay. Um, let me just uh, share my screen back. So, uh, till the training of the teacher model, uh, was it uh, audible? Yes, it was audible. Just now the screen share got uh, stopped. That's it. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so uh, now in this step, we are uh, preparing the student model. So student model with this very basic architecture of uh, the first set of quant layer and then added by the uh, max pooling and another set of uh, quant layer. And um, just a... Uh, uh, just a uh, configurable parameter here so that if we want in any case make the student model little dense or deeper so just a couple of more steps of max pooling and conf layers and at the end the global average pooling followed by two set of dense layers so this is our final student model architecture with trainable parameters of 1,44,261 so as i was already mentioning that how little this uh, student model is compared to the teacher model with just around like 15% of the total trainable parameters of the teacher model, right? So this student model is always very fast to infer 
compared to the teacher model. So uh, now we are just specifying the train loss uh, functions and the accuracy. So uh, here comes our main loss calculation function that I uh, already explained in the PPT. So this is our final total loss that is returning. And uh, in this uh, student class, uh, we are just uh, uh, simplifying the whole architecture that we are loading the trained teacher, the student model, and the temperature, all these things in the initializing step. And then the flow that uh, first we are getting the data. Then we are, uh, this images is the set of um, uh, images that it is getting in batches. So first with the trained teacher, we are getting the um, uh, teacher's output from on these images in this teacher logic. And then we are doing the same for the student. And then passing this student logic and the teacher logic along with the true levels and the other configurable parameters to calculate the KD loss. And this loss is uh, then used to back propagate and update the trainable variables. And uh, just like that, we are updating the loss and accuracy. So, and this is uh, just another uh, step of test step, do, doing the uh, uh, same thing for the testing purpose uh, without update, with, just without updating uh, the trainable uh, variables. So now uh, what uh, we are getting the student model from here, we are also passing the already trained teacher model and then we are training it for around 10 epochs. And if you see here, so ultimately this, after training this uh, just for 10 epochs, it reached to around accuracy of 0.6769, which is quite good taking the uh, size of the student model, how uh, teeny this is and how uh, very, uh, very, very, very lightweight this model is. So that's how this uh, knowledge distribution comes into picture, obviously you, you are totally encouraged to train the teacher model further along with training this uh, student model with around like at least uh, 100 to 500 epochs to reach to a higher stability of uh, accuracy and less uh, loss in the after the training process. So uh, this is pretty much for the practical uh, example of the whole uh, mechanism. So uh, after uh, this thing, let's go back to the PPT. So uh, any questions so far on this whole training and knowledge installation part? Okay, uh, taking that as no. So uh, now comes to the another um, part of this uh, knowledge installation that what about the easier topics where less number of classes are coming so for example binary classification so all the uh, examples and the example that i show you and also the mnist data set though that that data set is having like images of the digits and the flower data set was also having like five different classes of flowers but what about a little uh, easier data set or suppose a data set with less number of classes. So in those kind of scenario, like student, the student is always uh, encouraged to uh, have the uh, fun continuing in learning. And because this is a very like, uh, this, this kind of data sets can be said as very um, easy to understand compared to the other ones with less class distributions. Um, so finally, in this kind of data sets also, the uh, general knowledge distribution does not come into much of the effectiveness or advantage. So um, in the uh, Sir Hinton's paper, uh, he referred to subclass distillation. So subclass distillation is one more step ahead in this. So after the knowledge distillation, like for example, for binary classification, we get these two outputs from teacher, the softmax output, and as well from student, the uh, output. And then uh, these outputs are again divided into different subclasses. Like for example, for these two, for uh, one of these, um, for these two, we divide 
them into four subclasses and then ultimately summing them up to get the uh, latest prediction back so with this division we get uh, four classes out of these two and this uh, four class distribution will ultimately uh, have more advantage to put this knowledge distribution kind of methodology into picture and make the student understand the whole thing better so uh, this is the main thing and for reference uh, i would um, ask you to um, visit knowledge distribution article the wonderful one by uh, shayok palawar college sin alumni only in wonderb.i and the subclass distribution paper by sir hinton so ultimately like obviously um, computer vision is not just only about deep learning you can uh, do some uh, very uh, like cool stuff with this also so saying that thank you and thank you for having me here as a speaker thank you ranjan i am really sorry to both of you like both sarvagya and ranjan i expected uh, my team to do better there are very few attendees at the moment but uh, no i'll make sure me. i'll make sure to uh, be a lot more conscious about uh, whom i actually engage the media and pr team to be but anyway i'm uh, really thankful for both of you joining in i'm uh, really sorry on the part of my team uh, no issues no issues no, that's all right that's all right okay thank you everyone sarvagya i think uh, you can actually start the session okay cool. just give me a second Uh, hi. So, is my slide available? Uh, is, is it visible? Yes, yes, sir. Slide is visible. Okay. Uh, hi. So, uh, hi. My name is Sarvagya. Uh, I am currently in my final year of PTEC. I am studying in Manipal University, Jaipur. Uh, my final year of uh, software engineer uh, of my internship will be as a software development engineer with Hexaway Technologies. and uh, my favorite uh, my primary field of interest is data analytics and machine learning and uh, i'm very grateful to somdev for giving me a chance to be a part of this conference and uh, i hope by the, that by the time we're done with this talk i will have inculcated a new angle of thinking towards machine learning with all of you so uh, let's move forward so uh, first of all what are we talking about what exactly is machine learning so you will find numerous definitions of machine learning all over the internet wikipedia geeks for geeks you name it but i choose to go with it's simply a machine learning through analytics analysis performed 
on data on huge chunks of data through which a machine detects patterns and learns and makes predictions and classifications um uh, please if if there's any doubt throughout the session please feel free to interrupt me uh so so these days uh, artificial intelligence it's what you hear everywhere in almost all aspects of life you go to the hospital you are in college you are sitting for placements or you see a pilot flying an aircraft with autopilot on everywhere artificial intelligence is the hype Artic, uh, architecture medicine engineering aviation manufacturing everywhere so so at first we built machines to ease the effort we put into our work right but um, today we want to teach those machines to do all the work by themselves with very little intervention and uh, maintenance required from a human point of view so which most of the time i say is good tasks are done and might i say that they're done with exponentially high amount of accuracy compared to what a human brain can accomplish so i'll be discussing a few of these tasks today um, so when i first spoke with somdev i was told i have to speak on the real life applications of machine learning which i'll be doing in this talk but also i will take a few minutes to uh take a few case studies and try to see if we can think about uh, the applications of machine learning with a different directive with certain human principles included in it so let's move forward with that so first let's see what is required to get this process of machine learning going so some of you already may have worked with end to end machine learning systems in which case you will already know this but for the uninitiated machine learning isn't just taking a data set uh, yeah so machine learning uh, isn't just taking a data set from kaggle cleaning it and fitting it into an algorithm that's definitely how you will get started in the domain that is how we all start practicing learn the code but in the long run there are number of skills required to power that auto correct on your keyboard and you know to power the rise of uh, the virtual assistants which have come up recently so what are these uh, requirements first of all we can see data preparation capabilities this is nothing but cleaning the data formatting it according to the requirements of your algorithm of your machine learning system the usual uh, this is almost always the foremost step in machine learning because data is what the machine analyzes to learn which we had discussed earlier then there is the obvious the machine learning algorithms the supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning algorithms which are a few different ways through which we can uh, achieve machine learning capabilities in any system then comes in automation and iterative processes now when i spoke about data preparation uh, people who have just started in machine learning must have gone towards uh cleaning just one data set in one dot csv file applying a one hot encoder and creating dummy variables but that is not all think about this on a larger scale not just cleaning one csv file but to build a framework which efficiently cleans the data formats it formats it according to your algorithm's need and keeps passing it to your machine learning algorithm for constant improvement in real time this is what automation and iteration is you you build it once you create a pipeline and algorithm a sequence for the system to follow and it keeps doing it with the occasional intervention maintenance required from human hand then comes in scalability now scalable means uh, having a machine learning algorithm which can deal with large amounts of data now it is it is never going to be the case that you code a program right now today in 2020 and it will not require any more modifications 20 years from now of course it will but in the short run for the next 5 years for the next 6 years i can build a machine learning algorithm which can be implemented which is scalable 
which uh, which does not clog up the system pipelines which does not uh, uh, obviously when, whenever we make a machine learning algorithm we want it to be as efficient and fast as possible so so as to not hold up our end product but uh, with with a certain time period passing these data sets will start to increase so scalability is that is where it comes in we we want to keep it as efficient as possible for as long as possible and when that stops being the case we again make certain modifications to our code which bring us back to our original point then comes uh, ensemble modeling so this of this is one of the most uh, convincing ways to build a highly accurate predictive model it is one of the most powerful ways to improve the performance of your model this uh, in ensemble modeling we combine diverse uh, set of machine learning models different machine learning models to improvise the stability and the predictive power of the model so this is i hope this gives you a general idea of what end to end machine learning looks like when it's actually implemented um let's pr uh, proceed towards a certain real life examples now after which i will move on to the case studies so uh, google maps right you start driving to a destination once you move a little ahead in your way you will hear a statement like despite usual traffic you are on the fastest route how does it know that what the usual traffic is how does it calculate that this route that you are on is the fastest and not not any other one this 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 is done in real time and a lot of modeling is required for the upcoming situation but how 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 is uh, this whole decision making process uh, working so it works on three things first the number of people that are currently using the google maps application who are uh, google uh, so yeah so uh, the number of people that are currently using this service then next the historical traffic data which google has been collecting for years and the third one is crowd sourced information you have the option of uh, marking a road block or a uh, or a road accident at any place within google maps so these uh, algorithms the uh, so these functions these sources of data is what help uh, helps google maps give you the most accurate and the fastest route towards your destination and but one thing to keep in mind here is that routes are not calculated on what the situation is right now and what the situation has been in the past the algorithm used in google maps also takes into account what it thinks is going to be the condition of the traffic in the next few hours based on the historical data so uh, are there any doubts up until now no you can go on okay so okay next uh, we'll move on to uh, uber i'm sure you've all heard of it i'm sure all of you have used it a um, very simple applications within the uber app that we have noticed uh, the first of all whenever you open it based on uh, what location you are in and based on where have you gone from that location to some other point be in the past it automatically shows you those previous locations in your uh, uh, in the screen where where you have to input your destination Uh, similar to google maps uber also has its own prediction for the uh, estimated time of arrival to your uh, destination with the real time traffic data and route details then uh, ads recommendation uh, so imagine this you searched on uh, any shopping site like uh, amazon flipkart or myntra for any product that you were seeing Uh, you went through four or five variants of that product the next day onwards or two three days later you might start seeing that on some other websites that you visit like youtube or geeks for geeks you will start seeing ad recommendations of those pro uh, products so uh, search engines like google and 
you know amazon uh, when you sign into amazon all these services collect your browsing data they see what you are interested in what the user who is using that computer using that service what products interest in and they uh, show you more recommendations of that sort to increase their sales of their services and uh, one one such fact is that 35% of amazon's revenue is generated by its recommender systems so this is not uh, so human beings at one point coded this recommendation engine they taught it to learn from real time databases and that is it the system the computer is making money for the company of course with uh, as i mentioned previously uh, usual intervention and maintenance from the uh, developers uh then next up is apple two main applications of apple based on machine learning that i'd like to focus on first is touch id that uh, f- was first launched with iphone 10 uh it has drastically increased the security which was present in unlocking your iphone uh you can see the stats here and the apple's core ml framework so Uh, this is a framework which apple has implemented much like the swift ui which is also present for developing apps or apple ecosystems apple core ml with apple core ml framework you can create run encrypt and deploy machine learning models on mac systems uh, especially i think uh, many of you have seen the latest launch of the m1 chipset which was uh, there just a week back so this m1 chipset can run up to 11 trillion operations per second Uh, so these developments these strides made made, uh, made towards you know the uh, increasing the quality of machine learning development is very helpful in making advancements in this area next up i would like to talk of uh, more about a few more such applications uh, speech recognition which is the process of converting voice instructions into text uh, this these these work work on machine learning algorithms and uh, many uh, virtual voice assist- assistants like google assistant siri cortana alexa these are all using speech recognition models to you know power their main uh, algorithms then there is email spam filtering whenever we receive a new email it is filtered uh, automatically whether it is spam or is it a uh, normal email or is it important or is it from your social media uh, so the technology behind this is also machine learning certain algorithms that you might have heard of uh, behind this technology are uh, decision tree naive based classifiers uh, the multi layer perceptron model so these uh, three are the very frequent models used behind email spam filtering then there is uh, online fraud detection you know uh, so bank uh, banks uh, collect data of your spendings and they collect collect this data from their customers worldwide so uh, as you can imagine they have a pretty big chunk of data uh, to train their models on and to compare the future transactions with this database so if if um, if you do any transaction which the bank thinks might be illegal or it might not be you using your account they flag it they try to either block that or they try to get in touch with you immediately to confirm whether it is you making that transaction so this is all being built all all of these services are being built to help human beings and the best part is they are all automated they take a lot of uh, intensive coding in the beginning but once it gets going then only uh, the usual maintenance is required then there is again stock market tra- trading and ma- medical diagnosis uh, i'll get into detail about the medical diagnosis in the case studies that i have up now uh, but let's uh, get into why is artificial intelligence coming up now why now uh, back at a decade ago this uh, this machine learning deep learning data science they did exist it was not that they were not there the only problem was at that time the hardware required to make these technologies feasible 
in day to day services was not available which is why at that time machine learning deep learning and such technologies did not take a steep curve upwards but now we are coming up with these uh, affordable hardware which can efficiently run these algorithms even your uh, even our mobile phones uh, these days even 10000 rupees android phones are uh, are running programs that work on machine learning so nowadays this technology the price of running this technology and maintaining this technology has come way down which is why the main rise of artificial intelligence is coming up now the lack of computational power with the masses is going away and also again data analytics machine learning deep learning all of this work work on data and along with computational power now we also have better data collection facilities better data collection methods more efficient data collection methods which is why all of this is very feasible uh, as of now so the ability of uh, computers doing jobs in artificial intelligence has grown up dramatically in the past 3 years than it has in the past two decades uh, i think this was uh, said by one of the google executives in one of the talks that is where i, I uh, came to learn of this fact so now uh, i want to move on to one case study uh, one of the two case studies in my talk the first one is trios targeted real time early warning system this was developed at johns hopkins university by miss suchi sarya this program is basically built its sole purpose is to recognize and detect signs of sepsis sepsis is the 11th most leading cause of death in human beings uh, its purpose is to detect and diagnose sepsis before it reaches a stage where it cannot be cured where uh, the patient cannot be saved so the now as i said in the beginning of my talk machine learning works on data it finds patterns within data uh, patterns that uh, in 1 million rows of data human beings cannot possibly recognize but machines can machines do so the systems like trios are actually in today's date saving millions of lives all over the world every day it is being implemented uh, in hospitals uh, in such a real time manner that even when a patient goes in for a for a disease as trivial as a common cold the, the data is just stored in the databases but these systems run that data against their uh, predictive model against their classification model and against their historical data which can uh, diagnose whether or not a patient in this particular cases of trios has sepsis or not now i'll tell you why this is very very significant why this matters now obviously common cold is a uh, might turn out to be a very early symptom of sepsis but a normal physician would not be able to see through it whereas a machine might so i uh, looked up certain stats online certain medical stats through which Um, because because frankly i did not understand why this is uh, important at uh, such an early stage that is where my curiosity was piqued so i wanted to understand that apparently the mortality rate for such, uh, for for a disease like sepsis goes up as much as 7 to 8% in an hour so in 24 hours the condition of a patient can go from walking around to being on their deathbed and when data of patients ridden with diseases such as sepsis was run against this trio system it was discovered that this system could predict the diagnosis of sepsis 12 to 24 hours in advance of it reaching critical stage so the purpose of this 
program is to give doctors as much time as possible to come in and intervene before irreversible damage occurs so uh, that is why i think so you are telling me that in case of the diagnosis of sepsis uh, the artificial intelligence algorithm is a lot more uh, able to actually diagnose the problem right because it will see through things that a normal physician physician or a surgeon will not might miss on a, on a normal patient consultation i mean that's 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 awesome man yeah 12 to 24 hours can be very essential in a disease like this also i i while uh, doing this i came up uh, across one more such uh, disease it's called uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy this disease if um, diagnosed again in the early stages is completely curable but if it reaches a later stage it causes permanent blindness same goes with certain cases of cancer if diagnosed in early stages they can be controlled or cured so this is where ai is coming in and uh, and it's helping it's saving lives it's generating money and it is reducing human effort exponentially so uh, yeah this is one one part of my case study now the other thing is uh, another angle that i think we should take in while uh, you know developing machine learning algorithms now um, i'm sure all of you have heard of the term micromanaging you know if you have a team it it has a five to six level hierarchy and if you if if the person at the top of this ladder is micromanaging every team every team member every task the potential of the team is extremely lowered i think all of you will agree with this it is extremely lowered because 20 people can have 20 creative ideas but if 20 people are forced to work on the creative idea of just one person that obviously i think it makes sense that it will lower human uh, potential so not micromanaging will unleash potentials in teams that you did not know existed now how do we apply the same technique in machine learning one way to do this is give the machine a goal give the machine the tools but do not tell it how to get there this uh, philosophy is what was uh, uh, undertaken by tesla while developing the full uh, self driving capabilities in all its cars uh, um, the tesla uh, self driving model was taught how to control the mechanics of the car how to accelerate how to decelerate how to uh, you know control every aspect of that car it was also taught that you know what uh, uh, it was taught traffic rules because obviously that is one of the foremost safety uh, uh, safety points that one car autonomous car company has to follow and uh, but it was not told and and also it was told where the destination is it was told where you are right now point a it was told where it has to go point b it was taught how to control the car it was taught traffic rules but it was not taught how to recognize objects it was not taught to uh, recognize road blocks it was not taught uh, taught to recognize human beings it was not taught to um, you know recognize trees and highway boundaries this whole no, sorry but yeah so so that's basically like you teach someone a child an alphabet then you go for words and then you eventually leave it to himself and then he writes an essay on his own so that's basically reinforcement run learning of sorts R- right yeah yeah this this environment was obviously it was not just left on the road this was simulated in labs safety testing was done but it was yeah but it was not told you you know how uh, reinforcement learning works right with every a uh, good result you get an increment in the point which every with every negative result you get a decrement in the point but you uh, it learns on its own so that is what tesla um, uh, did with so its uh, self 
So you, you are basically on a gaming pad with a machine learning ecosystem, like just in case as in GoLang or uh, sorry, not GoLang, but the Go game. I am not familiar with what Go Go game is. I'm sorry. It was actually a game that was uh, that actually had it been beaten by the machine learning algorithm. I actually talked about it in my session. Uh, okay. uh, the machine learning ecosystem was able to beat the human uh, Olympic champion in Go. So okay, that wow, was- that is amazing, right? So that see, this is what you do not you this is what happens when you do not force your own ideas onto someone else or something else. You let them you tell them what to do, but you let them do it on their own. You let them explore their possibilities and their capabilities. It's actually a good life lesson as well. Right? Yeah. So uh, Tesla did the same thing, and uh, as of the past one year, it has been giving out uh, the Tesla Model S. that elon musk drives that is one uh, that is one of the very few cars i think less than 10 cars with complete full self driving capabilities self driving capabilities is being given out to normal cars also in tesla but that is only on motorways and highways and normal street roads but in the this fsd full self driving uh, cars it gets from your home to your office wh- wherever it is with no touch of human humans at all so i and 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 it is getting exceptional results so i think this is one of the angles which can be used towards thinking towards uh, artificial intelligence so i think uh, yeah i think that's all from my side and i hope this was uh, helpful in uh, making all of you think towards a new angle towards machine learning thank you sir vagya for the same Yeah, thank you. Okay, Devojoti, I think we can proceed with the last event for today. guys we will be back with our talk on uh, the eradication of covid-19 medicines fr- directly live from the neurips conference shortly
Hi there, my name is Dan Neal, and I'm the head of AI here at Benevolent AI. And today we'll tell you about how we leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence to develop life-changing medicines and a case study we have around COVID-19. So what does Benevolent AI do? Our mission is to unite technology with human intelligence to re-engineer drug discovery and deliver life-changing medicines. And why AI? Because pharmaceutical research and development is fraught with expensive failures, and there is no such thing as fast fail like there is in tech. Most drugs fail because of lack of efficacy in phase two and three clinical trials. And so there is a vast opportunity to improve on the status quo and de-risk drug research and development. Now, Benevolent has developed a tech and computational platform that enables our scientists to predict better and earlier which paths are more likely to lead to successful medicines. And by doing so, we can avoid costly mistakes and dramatically improve research and development productivity. And most importantly, we develop better medicines for our patients. Now, Benevolent achieves this by innovating across the full drug research and development pipeline. And we brought that together in the Benevolent platform, which is divided into four distinct focuses, our knowledge foundations group, target identification, precision medicine, and molecular design. may be wondering what each of these groups do. So here on the slide, I've added a few of our 2020 publications from each group. I encourage you to follow up and look into these in more detail. They provide a wealth more information around the fascinating, interesting challenges that each group faces and the research directions we've pursued to address those. In particular, I'd like to highlight some uh, work that we have here at NeurIPS uh, from our precision medicine group in the workshop on learning meaningful representations of life and from our molecular design group in the machine learning for molecules workshop. Please do check those out for more information. Now you'll hear this talk in four parts. Sayu will introduce our target inference platform and publication we have around that nature scientific reports called Rosalind. Next, you'll hear from Sia, who will tell you um, about some of our recent advances in natural language processing and her efforts in the knowledge acquisition and representation area. Next, you'll hear from Hamish around precision medicine. And finally, you'll hear from Ollie around our work on COVID-19. These are the scientists and engineers you'll hear from next. And with that, I'll hand, hand it over to Sai to pick up on our target inference platform. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Danny. Hi, everyone. I'm Sai. I'm the lead AI scientist at Benevolent, and I'll be giving you a brief overview of a recent publication from Benevolent that highlights the ability of our Trigger ID platform. A component of our Trigger ID platform, named Rosalind as a notch of Rosalind Franklin, is a combination of a heterogeneous biomedical knowledge graph and a state-of-the-art link prediction algorithm called tensor factorization. Rosalind allows us to learn meaningful embedding representations of biological entities. The graph itself consists of data from a wide variety of sources. About 20% of our graph consists of data extracted from biomedical literature, and the rest is a mix of everything from structured experimental data to health records to expert annotated edges. Here, an edge in the graph consists of a head, a relation, and a tail, in which the head and the tail represent two biological entities, say a disease and a gene, and the relation, as the name would indicate, describes how these two entities relate to one another. An example of an edge could be G1, the head, E therapeutic target for the relation, disease 1, the tail. Tensor factorization, an extension of matrix factorization, encodes each entity and relation as an n-dimensional embedding, and then updates that embedding using a reconstruction error. In Rosalind, this error is the difference between the score calculated using the complex decoder and the one-hot representation of whether edge, an edge exists or not. Here we use the quote, closed world assumption, and we consider that everything that is not true is false. Each entity and relation embedding is randomly initialized. And after training, we see that Rosalind learns meaningful representations of biomedical entities, clustering compounds and mechanisms around disease centers, and then clustering similar entities together. These learned embeddings are then used to produce a probability of each edge existing. For our purposes, we use these embeddings to identify those genes that have a high probability of being a therapeutic target for a particular disease. For a given disease relation pair, where the relation is is therapeutic, Rosalind then outputs a ranked list of genes based on their probability of association. And this process is known as gene prioritization. Rosalind is currently the only existing model that combines data integration and tensor factorization for gene prioritization and achieves state-of-the-art performance compared to other published gene prioritization methods shown in the leftmost plot. 
Most importantly, the flexibility of Roslyn allows us to infer meaningful relationships, like the probability that a particular gene or a drug target is successful in phase two clinical trial. As you see in the box plus on the right, the distribution of true failures in predicting on relation clinical trials. Failures is significantly higher than the score distribution of true successes, again when the model is asked to predict failure. This means that Rosalind assigns a higher probability of failure those edges that did in fact fail. Similarly, when predicting clinical trial success, the score distribution of true successes is significantly higher than that of true failures. Ultimately, this means that Rosalind can learn a meaningful relationship like clinical trial success and failure, and with a recall of 200 of 75%, Rosalind is able to correctly identify three out of four true successes or true failures in its top 200 predictions, depending on the predicted relationship. Finally, as a preclinical validation of Rosalind's ability to predict therapeutic targets, the top scoring Rosalind predicted targets for rheumatoid arthritis were sent to assay. The score distribution of those targets sent to assay versus the distribution of all predicted targets is shown in the leftmost plot. In the assay, patient derived cells were perturbed using inflammatory cytokines, making these cells mimic inflamed RA cells. After this, 55 compounds targeting Rosalind's top 55 predictions were tested on these excited cells. The readout endpoint of interest was a percentage reduction across these six key inflammatory cytokines shown along the x-axis of the right two plots. What we want to see is that the percentage reduction on the y-axis is comparable to the reduction found across four approved compounds from rheumatoid arthritis, the range of which is shown in the gray bands. What we found was that five out of the 55 Rosalind predicted targets did as well or better than the approved therapies. This 9% success rate is particularly encouraging in the context of drug discovery, where similar tests have shown roughly a 1% success rate in a comparable assay, and the alternative, a high throughput screen, is extremely expensive. Ultimately, Rosalind accelerates the drug discovery process by allowing us to send higher quality targets to assay in a streamlined way and improves the probability of the drought downstream translatability of our prioritized targets. Please check out the paper for more information and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll now hand things over to my colleague Sia, who will dive into our work around knowledge acquisition. Thank you, Sai. I'm Sia, and I'm going to talk to you about knowledge acquisition and representation of benevolent AI. Our drug discovery platform is powered by a knowledge graph. And this knowledge graph uh, has different types of data in it. We have on the left text derived data and ingested data. And you can think of these as data that aim to represent human biology uh, in a structured machine understandable form. And here in terms of text derived data, we have tens of millions of documents. And from this, we produce hundreds of millions of edges for the knowledge graph. And in just the data that come in structured form, um, in this we have tens of millions of edges and billions of omics data points. And now, apart from the general biology uh, data, we also have more patient-specific data. And here, um, the scale is uh, hundreds of billions of public or commercial uh, data points and millions or of partner or program data points. So the interesting statistics to know here is that over a third of the relationships that uh, benevolent AI has it in its knowledge graph are um, AI derived and proprietary. And interestingly, the platform uh, itself is agnostic to the therapeutic area. For example, it can be applied to different diseases and also agnostic to the type of drug. Uh, also, the platform is scalable and secure for deployment uh, in different environments uh, when we work with external partners. Uh, now I'm going to talk to you about information extraction, essentially the text derived side of the data, which is one of our most powerful uh, sources. 
And here you can see a very, um, let's say, standard example of uh, information extraction. Uh, it's a piece of biomedical text and some entities identified on it. You see some diseases, protein families, genes, and you can also identify entities. For example, here there is a certain gene uh, which has been downregulated in a certain disease, and we extracted that because this is what the text has been talking about. Uh, from now on, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview. Um, and in fact, some selected highlights from a few uh, recent uh, NLP uh, techniques that we have applied. Uh, here I'm going to talk to you about entity linking. So essentially identified entities. In the previous slide, we saw some entities being tagged by their types. We say, OK, this um, substring represents a gene, but we haven't said which gene it represents. And you can think of it as um, sometimes uh, a trivial problem, right? So, OK, we have a certain gene in a database. We look up its name. What's the big deal about this? In fact, this is very complicated in the biomedical domain because there are many ways in which a certain entity can be written in text. And importantly, it's very, very hard to know in advance the different variations that a certain name will have. Um, <clears throat> So in this example, we have a certain um, gene DCTN4 uh, as a modifier of chronic um, a certain disease. Uh, can we say that this CT, uh, sorry, this TN4 is that particular um, entity from our knowledge graph? And another interesting question, can we say that this entity is something new that we actually don't have in our knowledge graph. These are all very interesting questions. So very roughly, entity linking can be treated as a multi-class classification problem, uh, each entity being a class, and that assumes you have a manageable amount of entities, uh, or a nearest neighbor's problem where you embed the entity from your knowledge base and um, some uh, strings in the same vector space and look for similarities. And it can also be performed jointly with name vector recognition. And here on the right hand side of the slide, you see just one example of uh, some of our recent work, um, which was presented a few days ago at EMNLP. Uh, the reference is on the bottom left of the slide, so go and check it out. Uh, and now uh, I'll talk to you about corpus level relation extraction. So we saw uh, in a previous slide that from a certain um, piece of text, we extracted some relationships. Um, that's obviously challenging enough, but uh, it can get more challenging because uh, when we want to do relation extraction for knowledge base uh, construction, we actually need to be able to extract relationships from an entire corpus. It doesn't matter. Uh, what each particular, say, sentence or paragraph or document is saying. So we need some way of actually concluding uh, some information from an entire corpus. And one way of doing this is distance supervision. Uh, on the left here, you can see uh, there are different contexts for a certain pair of entities that we select. Think of them as, say, a window of words, a sentence, different types of context that get encoded. Essentially, we end up with a lot of different vectors. And then they get aggregated into one vector. So you can do that with some pooling, attention mechanisms, or anything. And then uh, for each pair, since we have one representation, that can be classified into its uh, the relationship that it represents, uh, including uh, a negative or no rela relationship. Sorry. Um, also, it is possible to incorporate some knowledge graph um, embeddings and do that um, jointly to increase the signal. Uh, which brings me to this slide. Uh, some recent work that we've done on jointly extracting and inferring relationships. So extracting relationships would be the task of essentially finding what is the relationship that is talked about in the literature, while inferring relationships would be answering the question of, given everything we know in our knowledge graph, 
can we infer things that have not be, been told but are easy to conclude? And we do these two different tasks jointly. Uh, a different um, piece of work, uh, which is quite important for us, is uh, representation learning. And we are learning a lot of different representations from text, for example, uh, embeddings for entities, for entity tuples, for relationships, um, especially if these are surface forms uh, in a more like relation discovery setup. And there are different uses for this. The obvious one would be parameter uh, initialization for uh, machine learning models, but also, I mean, they can be used for exploratory uh, use cases, for example, just finding and clustering similar entities, pairs, relationship, whatever it is that we're embedding. Now, on the right hand side, you will see some material from another recent paper. Again, it was presented a few days ago at MNLP. Uh, and this uh, shows a very elegant way of embedding, um, of um, essentially finding representations of uh, an entity pair uh, in the corpus in a completely unsupervised uh, manner. And here is um, a different um, approach. Um, very often uh, we talk about uh, machine learning as the solution to many problems, and this is definitely the case. Machine learning is very powerful, but we take for granted the fact that we have uh, data appropriate for the task in order to train those algorithms. And in some cases, this, this is true, uh, but there are often these bespoke use cases. So imagine a drug scientist or a domain, ex domain expert coming uh, to you and saying, I want genes whose mutation causes a certain disease and there might be some little data out there but not much or actually for another relationship there might there might not be any data available so we take this relationship of interest and we want to end up with some entity tuples like what you can see on the right so this particular gene causes that particular disease uh, so we saw that um, training data are scarce or uh, scarce or maybe not even non-existent right uh we could write some rules the problem with rules is you have to write them so uh they're laborious and also they're very restrictive so there is you're restricted by the rules that you write so you can't really have very much coverage and manual annotation uh doesn't scale especially for corpus level um, uh, relation extraction so one solution that we have which um is described in uh, one of the papers that we published last year. Again, the reference is on the bottom left of the slide. And this is a um, pattern discovery and pattern selection kind of methodology. Uh, we start with uh, dependency parsed sentences. Uh, here you can see um, in the top left of the slide that a certain uh, gene is mutated uh, in some patients of disease and the grammatical parse has found how each word relates to each other. Now, if we follow the path from each, um, uh, from the one entity to the other, for example, this trophin mutated in patient's disease, and then we rearrange the words in according to their original order in the sentence, uh, we will end up with patterns that you see in step one. Disease uh, caused by mutations in gene, gene mutations implicated in disease and things like that. Now we can take those patterns and show them to our domain experts in step two, for example, in the gray box, you will see a pattern and then below some example sentences to assist our domain experts in making some decision. Uh, and given those patterns that they select as representing the relationship they had in mind, we can go and find some pairs. Uh, yes, of course, there is a human in the loop, so this is not fully automated, but the important thing is that within just minutes, our experts can discover thousands of tuples with bespoke relationships, essentially relationships that we had absolutely no data for previously. And finally, I'd like to stress the fact that we work very closely with our domain experts. Um, and this is a small view from uh, one of the systems that we have that our um, domain experts uh, use on a daily basis. They can query the entire data set very quickly. Uh, they can explore different views, different kind of slicing of the data with their relevant relationships. And importantly, they can provide feedback that can go back into the original systems 
and improve them. And that was the end of uh, the knowledge uh, acquisition and representation part. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Hamish, who is going to talk to you about precision medicine. It's a sobering truth that most clinical trials fail, around 90%. One of the reasons for this is that diseases are heterogeneous in their onset, their progression, and their outcomes, and probably are composed of biologically distinct subtypes. We know this is true for breast cancer, for example. Drugs designed without this in mind are gambling as to which subtype will respond and ultimately fail to account for this during trials. Precision medicine at a as a field hopes to fix this by getting the right drugs for the right targets and the right patients. At Benevolent AI, we do this with machine learning. We frame precision medicine as an endotype discovery problem. An endotype is, a, is an observable trait in a subpopulation that has been linked to a distinct underlying pathobiological mechanism. This link to biology means that patients within endotypes are likely to have similar drug response. We have developed a workflow for endotype discovery, which I will describe here, and I'll later give a case study to show this in action. We begin with multimodal patient-level data, such as omics modalities like transcriptomics or genomics, and large-scale electronic health records. We then apply unsupervised learning models, which capture latent variations in the data in a representation that can elucidate patient subgroups and the underlying biological mechanisms. We can then perform aspects of a drug discovery process in a data-driven, endotype-specific way, such as identifying drug targets or selecting biological assays for target validation. Before diving into how we discover endotypes, it's worth providing some biological background. Fundamental to computational biology is recognizing its central dogma, that is, the direction and mechanism of flow of genetic information from DNA to proteins. DNA is the same in each cell. It's two meters long in each cell, and it encodes 20,000 genes. Genes are encoded in the DNA and are transcribed into RNA, which is an intermediate between DNA and protein. Proteins are ultimately the things we'd like to target, in diseases that are over underexpressed or are otherwise malfunctioning. But protein expression is difficult to measure in cells, and transcriptomics, which, measure, which measures the expression of RNA, is much more common and forms the basis for much of our work. This focus is a simplification because the path from mRNA to protein function is not a one-to-one -one chain of causation. It's a vastly complex system where abundance of one protein can suppress the transcription and translation of other proteins. The challenge of disentangling this network to discover new targets and mechanisms continues to drive our work, and it's an awesome playground for people who love complex and interesting data. So to present our omics workflow in a nutshell, we begin with a matrix consisting of a level of gene expression for each gene for every patient in the sample. Now, we hypothesize that the gene expression data are noisy observations of heterogeneous biological processes, meaning the underlying generative process at a mechanism level is much lower rank than the 20,000 genes that we measure. To disentangle these latent mechanisms, we apply latent variable models such as independent component analysis, sparse factor analysis, or autoencoders. Improving these models is a rich area of research in our precision medicine group, focusing on improvements in scalable Bayesian inference, structured priors, and sparsity to better capture the data generating process. Now, the output of, this de of, the, of the models is a decomposition that aligns assignment, that allows assignment of mechanisms or groups of genes and subgroups of patients to each latent dimension. At this stage, each latent variable represents a candidate endotype, one which may be signal or noise and we need to apply an introspection process to identify the most promising findings. The goal of our introspection process is to comprehensively characterize our latent representations. 
We want to know whether each latent variable captures noise such as experimental batch effects or environmental effects associated with patients such as their smoking status. We want to check whether the latent variables correlate with biomarkers or patient outcomes such as survival. We also check whether the genes correspond to a biological mechanism using protein-protein interaction networks and known sets of genes to mechanism data sets to undertake interaction or enrichment analyses. Finally, we interrogate differences in the expression of genes among subgroups. This leads us to a short list of endotypes with the most promising characteristics. But how do we go from here to a target? To show how we get from a theoretical endotype to a validated target, I'm using a case study from a disease program we work on at BAI called glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is a nasty, aggressive type of cancer that can occur in the brain or spinal cord. Here we found two endotypes, which we'll call endotype A and endotype B. Endotype A here is associated with a clinical specific subtype. The genes are immunity genes who can regulate the tumor microenvironment, and the patients in the endotype have a lower survival rate. Endotype B is related to stem cells, which are cells that can reproduce themselves and sustain the tumor. This endotype is also associated with lower survival. But which gene of the endotype should we target? Amongst all the complex interactions of proteins, some genes in the endotype may just, just be misregulated by other genes upstream within the chain of events. Knowing this, we can use network diffusion methods in a protein-protein network, accumulating evidence of interactions to lead us to our chosen culprit. Now, once we have those targets and we have identified a compound that can appropriately suppress the proteins, we need to validate our findings. We do this with collaboration with several academic labs around the world. Here we use patient-derived neurons, which are grown in a dish and then treated with the drug. If we have the right patients for that target and the right drug, we'll see an effect in the dish. Now to add extra complexity, one of our endotypes is related to a tumor environment, meaning a single cell was insufficient. So luckily, our collaborator had world-leading technology to grow a cluster of cells to mimic the 3D environment of the tumor in the dish. This allowed us to validate the targets, demonstrating the journey from data to real biological results in the lab. Now to finish, I also wanted to briefly describe a complementary workflow we've developed using clinical data. So we exten extensively work on le learning endotypes from electronic health records, also known as EHRs. Large-scale EHRs are growing in scale and availability, and linked with genetics data are a rich resource for AI research for precision medicine. EHRs typically consist of a wide variety of healthcare data, including longitudinal records of disease diagnoses, procedures, medications, and outcomes. These are encoded in clinical ontologies such as ICD or READ diagnosis codes. EHRs can also capture multivariate time series of important biomarkers. These could include physiological measurements of things like body composition, function such as lung function, or laboratory measurements with things like cell counts. Many of these are familiar to us from visiting the doctor. We are motivated by the disease heterogeneity that is captured in EHRs. The data shows differences in disease onset, progression, and outcomes in many diseases. So why is it that some disease patients have many other diseases known as multimorbidities? And how can we dis distinguish between disease causes and disease consequences? It's these sorts of questions that we are hoping to use machine learning models to answer. So, like the omics workflow, this workflow also focuses on un unsupervised representation learning, searching for factors of variation that can elucidate differences between subgroups. For example, we can take longitudinal records of clinical ontologies such as ICD or read diagnosis codes, as well as physiological measurement time series 
and organize them in appropriate data formats. We can apply standard or sequential latent variable models or time series clustering models to find subtypes. Now these can be characterized via an introspection process according to clinical concepts such as comorbidities and patient outcomes such as survival. These help us understand what the latent variables are trying to capture and whether they may be signal or noise. If the data is available, we can also associate our findings with genetics, which makes uh, the workflow actionable for drug discovery processes such as target identification uh, in similar ways to the omics workflow that I described. So yeah, this one was short but sweet, but it was great to share our precision medicine workflows with you. Now Ollie will talk to you about our work on identifying a treatment for COVID-19. Thanks Hamish for the overview of precision medicine. We're gonna keep our focus now on patients while we talk about COVID-19. Hi, uh, my name's Ollie. I'm one of the lead software engineers at Benevolent. Uh, I'm involved in the construction of the knowledge graph, uh, as Sia talked about earlier, as well as our COVID-19 response. So to cover a little bit of what we've seen before, Danny told you a bit about uh, benevolence and our business, why it is that we exist. Uh, Sia described a little bit about how we create knowledge graphs using AI models and how our scientists are able to use them to do novel science. And then Hamish just described the process by which we identify and understand subgroups of patients or endotypes. And all of that gives a flavor of the complexity uh, of drug discovery, something about the risky nature of it as well, with how much it takes, how much time it takes uh, to come up with uh, a new drug. And the timing question is one that we've all, all asked this year, uh, as we've been waiting for treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. So over the next few slides, I'm going to describe a little bit about how we used our technology and AI uh, to cover COVID-19. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did and also a bit about the science that we uncovered, because it's really important to understand the domain in which our algorithms and our tech uh, get employed. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened next. So 2020 started uh, with scenes a little bit like this one, emerging from Wuhan in China. The blue sign on the left there is talking about the things that you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be going out, shouldn't be going to restaurants, shouldn't be going to see friends, etc. You should treasure your life and treasure those of others, etc. And these mantras that have now been translated into pretty much all languages uh, are ones that we've had to live by uh, during this year uh, in what has been a, a pretty unusual start to the decade. And at that time, when it was still confined to China, uh, but very much on, on the rise uh, as an epidemic, uh, our CEO, Joanna, called up and said, what is it that we can do to help the people uh, in China? How can we use our tech to help those people who are suffering from this awful disease? There must be something that we can do. And the answer was yes, but with a caveat. You see, the data that we've talked about so far is stuff that's coming from experiments and, and work and research that's come in the past uh, from, from years of, of effort and work. And then we have to look at a disease that's only been known about for about a month. And so the question is what to do in a circumstances where the data is clearly missing. A crucial question for all of us when we consider about how to design and train intelligent systems. And so this is one of the reasons why it's so important to have your users and scientists close to you. Um, it's about having that scientist able to uh, interpret the question. And the success for us, uh, Benevolent, is that interaction between the data, the algorithms, and the domain experts. In this case, the expert is uh, Peter, who's in charge of pharmacology at uh, Benevolent AI. And so what he did was to think of a different way of asking a question such that we could use the data that we had and the data that existed come the beginning of 2020 uh, to be able to make some meaningful um, improvements to the science. So here's a picture uh, of the knowledge graph uh, that we uh, adapted to work with uh, COVID-19 data. Uh, you'll see certain treatments in there, such as remdesivir in the middle, uh, which is, has become famous during this year as a, as a treatment for, for COVID-19. Now, when we built this, ultimately, there wasn't a huge amount of information out there about COVID-19. 
Um, and so the question was, like, how do you use uh, what we have there? And it's ultimately a question of some imagination on the part of our users. And what Peter did was to think less about the novel coronavirus and more about the processes uh, that are involved with it. Um, and so one of those processes is the means by which uh, a virus gets into your cell in order to uh, replicate itself, reproduce, uh, and ultimately go about its business. Um, and it was known fairly early on that the coronavirus, uh, the SARS coronavirus 2, um, binds to a protein on the membrane of the cell called ACE2. And once that happens, a process uh, initiates uh, by which the uh, viral protein, uh, the virus is in enveloped by the membrane and then brought into the cell, uh, a process known as endoc endocytosis. And once it's inside the cell, the virus can go about reproducing, burst out of the cell and leaving uh, a mayhem in its wake. The other thing that was known quite early on uh, about COVID was the severe inflammatory response brought about by the body's immune system, which when left unchecked uh, in some patients can become very dangerous, a severe inflammation uh, that can be so dangerous. And so that led us to um, the two critical mechanisms that were in play here, the means by which the virus gets into the cell, endocytosis, and the inflammatory response uh, created by the body when it's reacting uh, to this viral infection. And each of these processes uh, is mediated, enabled, regulated uh, by various proteins produced in the body. And so the question becomes, is there an approved drug out there that could be working on both of these systems? It's a little bit like a polynomial equation where we've got three variable terms and we want to find uh, the answers to that. Unfortunately, I don't have time to cover the full details of what we did, uh, except to say that this pattern, which itself is a graph, can be used as a query on, on, on our knowledge, by, knowledge base. Uh, and that we used network analysis uh, on, the, on the gene networks involved for these different processes to reduce down the number of potential options uh, out there. And so after we um, queried our, our graph for what treatments are available, um, one compelling option came up, um, which is this one, baricitinib, which is a treatment for rheumatoid uh, arthritis. It's been approved for a few years, um, and it seemed to have some quite compelling reasons uh, for, for research in COVID-19, as it seems to be able to, uh, to work both on the um, inflammatory response, as well as having some hitherto un unexplored antiviral properties. So if I go back to my cell diagram here and we look at the endocytosis process in, in a bit more detail, uh, we can see that it is um, stimulated uh, by a couple of proteins, AC1 and GAC. And baricitinib um, is able to inhibit both of those, and therefore it is able, uh, theoretically, to reduce the way in which uh, the, the cell uh, would envelop and ingest the virus into itself, where, whereby the infection would continue. And so these findings we published uh, in a medical journal, The, the Lancet, um, about a week or two after our CEO had asked uh, for what we could do. This was at the very beginning of February. Um, even though we anticipated this would be a treatment that would be um, most valuable for, for people in China, by that time the pandemic had moved on and it was Italy that was at the forefront uh, of the um, response. Uh, and indeed, come March, uh, groups of Italian doctors had read about uh, our research and they'd started to treat uh, some patients of COVID-19 uh, in, in some limited studies, which were showing early anecdotal and positive results. Uh, come April and May, uh, the owner of baricitinib, Eli Lilly, uh, announced an agreement with the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, another institution that we've grown to know quite well uh, during 2020. And they started the first large-scale randomized clinical trial uh, to, to prove whether or not this was, was a genuine effect. And in the meantime, a number of uh, trials, including ones in Italy, continue to show positive results. 
as of uh, September 2020, uh, there was positive data released from this trial uh, that showed that baricitinib, when combined with remdesivir, uh, was reducing the recovering time uh, in hospitalized patients, which is a good thing. Uh, and in fact, there was a 35% lower mortality rate overall uh, in the group of patients taking baricitinib. And people were spending lower, less time in hospital as well. And come November, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the FDA granted emergency approval for baricitinib as a treatment for COVID-19. So this treatment that we discovered uh, has joined a very small club uh, of approved treatments uh, that are available to work uh, on, on COVID-19 um, until such a time as the, as the vaccines uh, are able to, to take the rest of the strain. And so I can finish by giving a few learnings uh, about what, what we found from, from the experiences of 2020. The first is uh, that working with domain experts and technologists really is key, whether it's working on, on COVID or doing the, the work that we do uh, every day at Benevolent. Having domain experts uh, beside you can create so much impact. It's the combination of the speed and systematic nature of algorithms uh, combined with human insights and decision making adds up to quite an amazing team. The second is that a pipeline of intelligent processes um, is, is a very important way of thinking about the application of AI. You can think of AI as being a means by which you answer a question directly, uh, but it can also be a creator of further data that answers more questions. So it may be whether you want to create a narrow scope of answers or a, broaden, uh, a broad scope of potential answers. And there are good reasons for doing both. All new technologies will bring exciting new opportunities, uh, especially when you have the opportunity to try out those ideas. It may take you in directions you've never anticipated. Uh, if, if you feel that you can, can drop things and try, try different approaches. Uh, and new avenues of exploration uh, can always open up. So finally, um, COVID-19 uh, has shown some, some, some things that we believe to be impossible, to be possible after all, and more achievable. As a tech company, we're uh, designed around the concept of disruption, but even for, for us, two months uh, to go from a theory into patients and an emergency approval within 10 uh, is quite unprecedented. And so while COVID has caused untold disruption and misery and death, it has shown that some things are more possible than we thought. Um, and that may extend indeed into your sectors or technology or research. And it's worth thinking of the ways that we can seek out the new opportunities that exist. So I'd just like to end by plugging a couple of presentations that we're giving uh, at the Meaningful Representation of Life workshop. Um, we're going to be talking about the kind of data that can be uh, taken from electronic health records, uh, including patient outcomes, biological meaning, and disease progression. And then in the Machine Learning for Molecules workshop, uh, we're using uh, language models to come up with molecular representations. And so we welcome you to join us uh, for either of those presentations. Um, and in between those times, uh, we set up a networking platform to carry on the discussion uh, uh, amongst our team throughout uh, the New Europe's conference. And so we'll have various meetups and networking sessions available. Uh, if you can use the QR code or search for Benevolent AI in Europe's 2020, then please do so. And we'll be very happy uh, to talk to you there, whether it's about um, our domain of AI and drug discovery, whether it's about careers with Benevolent or any other questions you may have. So on behalf of all four of us, uh, thank you very much for listening, and we're happy now to take any of the questions that you'll have. Thank you.